Today we come to the book of Nahum. Now it's a very tiny book, just three chapters. I believe very, very, very few Christians have actually read it. And of those who read it, they're not very sure what is the purpose of this book. Now it looks like Nahum is just attacking the empire of Assyria, predicting their downfall. Now we've heard that before. That was what Jonah was supposed to do. He went there to preach to Nineveh. And Jonah is the other one who has went to Nineveh besides Nahum. Jonah went 150 years before Nahum. Of course, in the books, they look very close. And of course, Jonah had an amazing experience there. It showed how merciful God is, even to a wicked, wicked empire like Assyria. It was wicked, really a terrible place. They tore, tortured, they plundered, they looted, they killed mercilessly. And yet God sent Jonah to them to preach to them and ask them to turn. And they did. And so there was repentance for a while. But 150 years later, we see the old Assyrian nature comes up without a new heart. Things don't last very long. Whatever things happen, take place for a while and then back revert to the oppressive, selfish, heart, heartless heart, right? So this time, Nahum is sent 150 years later, and this time, no more forgiveness. Too late. There is a time, there is a time, God is slow to anger, but at some point, God's anger will erupt, right? Some people describe it as a simmering anger. God is angry with sin, but it simmers. It's like a boiling pot of water. It just bubbles. And it comes 100 degrees centigrade, the water boils over then you better turn off the fire or we, everything will spill out. That is like God's anger. It comes to a certain point. We don't know when. In water, we know it's 100 degrees centigrade. In God, I don't know when. But I say the boiling takes a long time. And in that long period of hundreds of thousands of years, men say, God's not doing anything. It's okay. We can sin. Right? That's because they don't understand the character of God. Many Christians are like that. They, they sin and sin and nothing happens. They're still prospering. And they say, I think this sin is okay, though the Bible tells them clearly it's not. And they say, but God's not doing anything. Right? And they don't understand this character of God. So when we see Jonah and then we see Nahum, this connection, how come at that point, God does such an amazing work in the hearts of the people and the king. It gives them the heart of repentance. But in this case, he said, no more. I'm not doing anything. I'm just going to destroy them. All right? So, you see, when you see sequences of books like, oh, Jonah already told them. Now Nahum goes back to the same city and preaches. So what's the connection? There is a huge connection. But if you just jump the Bible, uh, uh, hopscotch method of reading, then you don't see these things. Okay, so the fullness of God's anger on this horrible empire of Assyria had come. Just like Samaria, the, the golden calves, for hundreds of years, God didn't do anything. So people said, it's okay, God's not angry. Minor irritations here and there, some famine, and all that. it's okay, it's natural calamity. Neighbors attack them, they say, well, that's neighborly competition. Until they were slammed up and went to Samaria. You know, the Jews up to today learn the lesson. Jews do not recognize Jesus as Messiah, but one thing you'll never find a Jew worshipping is an idol. They got cured of idolatry. 
never a billet golden cow for anything again. Nothing freaks out a Jew more than an idol. Okay, so we see here a little, a very important character of God that you and I must be aware of. God's anger is against sin, any sin that is simmering, not boiling over. Okay, now Nineveh after this, about 50 years after, 50 years, a long time, after Nahum, his prediction was totally annihilated, destroyed. In fact, nobody knew where the ruins were. For hundreds and hundreds of years, they didn't have a clue where it was. Until about 1800s, some archaeologist, some British guy, digging and digging and digging around that part of uh, the Mesopotamia, discovered, oh, these are the ruins of Nineveh. It was so annihilated. The Bible predicted it would be a place for, you know, wild animals to live in. Actually, it is up to today, mm. right? Now, Nahum's name is just nothing, but you remember the town of Capernaum? Capernaum in the New Testament, where Jesus said, Woe unto you, you don't want to listen to God's word? Capernaum. Capernaum means village, village of Nahum. I don't know whether he was born there or not, I don't know, but it's named after Nahum. Caper, village of Nahum. Nahum's a well-respected prophet, even among the Muslims. His grave his tomb is somewhere in Mesopotamia, revered by the Muslims. Okay, now since it's such a little book, we can go through like a, uh, I would call it a, a quick Bible study, all right? And I like Bible study. I like verse by verse actually better than doing book by book. But I am doing the book by book because I think we need to see the connections. Okay, so let's look at uh, Nahum chapter 1 and verse 2. The Lord is jealous and avenging God. It's a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. Wow. Vengeance, vengeance, avenging three times. <laughs> what does that tell you? All right? That tells you that God hates what the Assyrians are doing. He's going to take revenge. Revenge on what? We will see later. Right? He's a jealous God. Why? Number one, he's jealous for his people. Assyria conquered his people, bullied his people. And I said God is a jealous God. Right? His children are precious to him. Don't mess with my children. Don't take my children. Don't bully my children. Okay? So God is a jealous God. But he's also a avenging God. Now, I don't know. We don't hear that in preaching nowadays. Huh? God is gracious. God is loving. God is also avenging. Right? Against wickedness, oppression, etc. So verse 2 is, bang, hard on Assyria. Verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger, great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. Right? So we see heart, then God's gracious. We see this style is found in verse 1. His way is in the whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Wow, he's majestic. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. Wow. The majesty of God. Okay. So we see how slow he is to anger. Then we see in verse 6. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are broken into pieces by him. Wow. Anger. Then verse 7. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. Wow, can you see the balance of God here? Anger and mercy. 
all right what do you plot against the lord you will make a complete end trouble will not rise up a second time for they are like entangled thorns like drunkards as they drink they are consumed like stubble fully dried for you from you came one who plotted evil against the lord worthless counselor look how can you plot against the lord verse 12 thus says the lord though they are at full strength and many they will be cut down and pass away though i have afflicted you i will afflict you no more god's people huh? and now i will break his yoke from off you and will burst your bonds apart the lord has given commandment about you no more shall your name be perpetuated for the from the house of your gods i will cut off the carved image the metal image i'll make you grief for you are vile then nice behold upon the mountains the feet of him who brings good news who publishes peace keep your feast o judah fulfill your vows for never again shall the worthless pass through you he is utterly cut off can you see the strong punish you i will protect you punish good news coming for you huh? i hope you see you see this is the balance that is lacking in our understanding of god because we choose the verses we like who likes the verses of god's anger and vengeance very rare today it's almost hard to hear this kind of preaching it's kind of weird bizarre nobody preaches this kind of preaching okay so i hope you see here the need to read this and first poetry it's poetry heart like heart like all right and i'm told this is in some form of acrostic so the the jews can remember this okay now we come so in the chapter one basically is who is this horrible guy that god is dealing with right assyria god's angry with assyria okay now how is he going to fix it okay let's look at verse uh, chapter 2 i'm going to read it right the scatterer has come up against you man the ramparts watch the road dress for battle collect all your strength for the lord is restoring the majesty of jacob as the majesty of israel for plunderers have plundered them and ruined their branches right why is god angry so angry with the assyrians because they have plundered his people what's plundering plundering is when you are strong you go in with your weapons and you take whatever you want from those weaker than you all right now you say wow in those days so cruel uh, People do this kind of thing, Assyrians. Assyrians are the first world empire, as far as we, we know, that went around like that, right? Basically, the one business for Assyria, one business. What made Assyria a mighty empire, the mightiest empire of that time, was basically their plundering. You say, what's the business of Assyria? Plundering. How did they get wealth? from plunder, from loot, from grabbing from other people. You mean they have no like industry, they have no talent uh, making silk, silk or selling tea or, or stuff like that, you know, uh, making linen cloth. No, 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 nothing. You mean they didn't grow great amounts of food for export? No. Where was their wealth from? Plunder. Okay. And then we see here, right, in uh, verse 3, the shield of his mighty man is red. His soldiers are clothed in scarlet. This is very amazing. That was the dress of the Babylonians who, the military uniform of the Babylonians was red. Now, never before did military people wear red. Red's usually a very attractive color that women wore, right? Fancy, you know? But 
the Babylonian army was dressed in scarlet. This was like long before the Babylonians became a power. Babylon was a tiny little place at the, this time. It was a non-entity, right? Wearing a scarlet uniform army was an unthinkable thing, but it was predicted. The chariots come with flashing metal. On the day he musters them, the cypress spears are brandished. The chariots race madly through the streets. They rush to and fro through the squares. They gleam like torches. They dart like lightning. He remembers his officers. They stumble as they go. They hasten to the wall. The siege tower is set up. The river gates are open. The palace melts away. Its mistress is stripped. She is carried off. Her slave girls lamenting, moaning like doves and beating their breasts. Nineveh is a pool whose waters run away. All the people are disappearing. All the armies running away. Halt, halt, they cry, but none turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. There's no end of treasure or of the wealth of all precious things. So when the Babylonians went in, you know what? They did exactly as the Assyrians have done. They plundered the wealth of Assyria. It was unbelievable gold and wealth because Assyria had been looting countries, really ravaging, destroying nations, bringing them to absolute poverty, right? Taking slaves, taking money, taking everything, stripping the land bare. Now the Babylonians come in and there's plenty of loot there. You say, wow, all this, all this so terrible. Huh? What kind of people? Thank God I don't live in those days. Huh? And it's probably in your mind, say, thank God we don't live in those days. Chapter 2, verse 10. Desolate, desolation and ruin. Hearts melt, knees and knees tremble. Anguish is in all loins. All faces grow pale. Where is the lion's den? The feeding place of the young lions, where the lion and lioness went, where his cubs were, with none to disturb. The lion tore enough for his cubs, strangled prey for his lionesses. He filled his caves with prey and his dens with torn flesh. You see the word lion, 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 I don't know how many times. That was a symbol of Assyria. All right? They stripped people. They took anything for their wives and for their kids. Like people and nations were like toys to them to, to take and give to their children and take the, the things of other people to fill the houses and palaces of their own families. Wow. So terrible, huh? All right. So we see here, plunder, plunder. You see, thank God we don't live in that era. Well, we do. You know, it's never ended. In fact, it became worse. The age of colonialism, where every powerful one who had gunboats, who invented armaments, came and took any country they wanted. They left Europe, they went to Africa, and just took country after country, slave after slave, conquered the countries, colonized almost the entire continent of Africa. Then they colonized almost all of Asia. It was the rare country that was not colonized. What's called what is colonialism? Empire building. Who started empire building? The Assyrians. God like it? No. God hates oppression. God hates powerful people taking advantage of poor people. God hates powerful people taking advantage of weak people. God hates smart people taking advantage of less smart people. But it takes, goes on. All right, we live through the age of colonialism. I was born singing God Save the Queen. I don't know why I was doing that. Well, I was told it was the right thing to do. I was told 
we are blessed because they came and took us. Filipinos, the Spaniards just went, killed their chieftains, and just took the land and call it the Philippines, named after King Philip. Hey, my friend, the Filipinos are living happily and peacefully there for yawns, right? Now, please don't see this as Assyria. Assyria was, is just a symbol. It's a symbol of oppression, which continues today. And because it is so pervasive, it became so much a part of our history that we thought it was normal. We thought it was acceptable. And worse still, we thought it was good for us. All right? Okay? Later we'll see how it all works. Chapter 3. So Nahum's not about some remote king, you know, who is this king? I don't even care about his name. In fact, there's no Assyria now. There's no Nineveh now. What's this got to do with me? <laughs> Plenty, right? Except we don't see it, right? Because we don't read it. <clears throat> and when we read it, we don't understand it. Okay? It's some strange, minor prophet talking about a past issue. <clears throat> All right, chapter 3. Woe to the bloody city! all full of lies and plunder, no end to the prey. I want you to just note the word lies there. I mean, hey, you plunder, you don't need to lie, man. You just slash. Why bother to lie? Lying is quite different from plundering. Later we'll see. The crack of the whip, the rumble of the wheel, galloping horse and bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear. Hosts of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over the bodies. Right? So we see a slaughter of Nineveh, of Assyrian, the Assyrian Empire. And all for the countless whorings of the prostitute, graceful and of deadly charms, who betrays nations with her whorings and peoples with her charms. Hey, I thought they are coming and slashing people and uh, killing them. There's no charm about it. There is no seduction in, in slashing. How, how do you talk about lies and plunder? And then you talk about brutality and charm. My goodness, what in the world is all this about? Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord and will lift up your skirts over your face and make nations look at your nakedness and kingdoms at your shame. I will throw filth at you and treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. And all who look at you will shrink from you and say, Wasted this Nineveh, who will grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters for her? I hope you're getting to see a little glimpse of the actual sin of empires. They brutalize you, then they seduce you. They lie. They say, you know, all this brutality is for you good. They charm you. They colonize you and they say, you know, your ancestors were so stupid. You natives are so ignorant. Be so thankful we colonize you. Now, you should thank us for colonizing you. Wow. You know, it's a prostitute. You pay her to mess your life up. You think she gave you a favor. All right? That's it. That is empires. They come and they not only are cruel to you, they lie. They deceive your brain. They smash your body 
and they deceive your brain. But God said one day, I will lift, look at verse 5, second part, lift up your skirts over your face, make nations look at your nakedness. In other words, all this covering, looking so nice and good, I'm going to lift up your skirt, show there's nothing there, you're just filthy, you're just a fake, you're just a liar, you're just an oppressor, right? Now, I never remember, never forget what my dad said to me. My father grew up under the British Empire. He was what I would call a brainwashed colonial person. He looked up to the British as mighty men. Thankful he was under the protection of the British Empire. Thankful for being a servant of the British. And he said to me, you know, I had a turning point in my life. I said, what was it there? He said, you know, when the Japanese came, we hated the Japanese. We were little fellows. We were told they were useless by the British. We were told they would, they had tin can kind of armaments. We were told that Singapore would never fall because the British Empire would never fall. In a few days, Singapore fell. And my dad said, I saw this white man who I looked up to as my heroes. They were cowards, he said. They just gave up like that. The Japs slapped them, and my dad said, I saw they were just nothing. I woke up, he said, and realized they had brainwashed my brain to believe that they were my savior, they were my protector, they were my hope, and I should be thankful to them. You know, this is what God says. One day, you lift up the skirt, you know, all the pomp and all that, and you see what underneath? Nothing. Zero. This lies. So the Assyrians not only plundered, they made the natives feel so inferior that they were not even human. You know, for many Asians, we actually thought we were subhuman. Right? Because brainwashed. Okay? Now, I'm not talking, this is not an anti colonial talk. This is just. Bible talk, right? We are thankful we learn English. I'm thankful I speak English. I'm thankful for the rule of law, etc. But it doesn't change the fact. They came, they took the land with a gun, all right? They ruled over us, all right? And made us feel less than human, okay? We were stupid natives who can't do anything, right? And we believed it, okay? So, this is what I'm just seeing, all right? Please don't see this as, I'm not here, it's not a political issue. I have no interest in politics, right? I'm just interested in seeing what the Bible says, okay? Verse eight, are you better than Thebes? That's a big city in Egypt, right? Assyria finally conquered Thebes and became really the world power. That sat by the Nile with water around her, her rampart, the sea, and water her wall. Thebes was like inconquerable, invincible. Cush was her strength, Egypt too, and that without limit. Put and the Libyans were her helpers. She had allies. Egypt had this Thebes, a city, geographically very sound, had great allies, yet she became an exile. She went into captivity. Assyria just conquered it. Her infants were dashed in pieces. That's what the Assyrians did at the head of every street, for her honored men lots were cast, and all her great men were bound in chains. You also will be drunken. You will go into hiding. You will seek a refuge from the enemy. So God is telling the Assyrians, you know, you thieves thought they would never fall. They fell. You thought you'll never, you will be too. All your fortresses are like fig trees with first right figs. If shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. Right? Fix, you just shake the tree, they fall. 
Behold, your troops are women in your midst. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. Fire has, de fire has devoured your bars. This, when I read this, reminds me of the fall of Singapore, the impregnable British fortress. Okay, Your troops are women in your midst. They surrendered like that, British troops. All right? Just like that, without a fight. Hmm? The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. The Japs marched in, all right, and fire devoured your bars. Okay, brainwashing. Singapore will never fall. Draw water for the siege. Strengthen your forts. Go into the clay. Tread the mortar. Take hold of the brick mold. Okay, do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. There will be, there will the fire devour you. The sword will cut you off. It'll devour you like the locust. Multiply yourself like the locust. Multiply like the grasshopper. Do whatever you want. You, you increase your merchants more than the stars of the heavens. The locust spread its wings and flies away. Your princes are like grasshoppers. Your scribes like clouds of locusts settling in the fences in a day of cold. When the sun rises, they fly away. No one knows where they are. Right? That was the mighty British forces of Singapore. They evaporated on that day and left helpless Singaporeans at the mercy of the Japanese, right? <clears throat> your shepherds are asleep, O king of Assyria. Your nobles slumber. Your people are scattered on the mountains with none to gather them. There is no easing your hurt. Your wound is grievous. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you, for upon whom has not come your unceasing evil. End of Nahum. What kind of ending is that? <laughs> I like this Bible endings that seem like no ending here because the Bible is not one, not 66 books with endings. There's one ending, it's called Revelation, all right? A lot of people get very mystified when a Bible book seems to have no ending. Why should it? Why should a chapter have an ending, all right? The chapter leads on, okay? So we see here, for upon whom has not come your unceasing evil question mark? No answer. What is this whole book about? It is about what we consider the perpetual cycle of human oppression, human violence, and human suffering. And you know what? We have been so used to it that we consider it normal part of life and acceptable and believe that God is doing nothing about it. I mean, it's part of life. So, what's there to get excited? What's there to get angry? See, that's how we've been indoctrinated by the oppressors that you people oppression from those stronger than you just accept it it's part of life and christianity today doesn't say a word about oppression it doesn't do anything to help the oppressed 99 percent of christians think that's none of our business let me tell you god is concerned for the widow, the orphan, and the alien or foreigner. In other words, God is concerned for the weak. And if God is concerned, I, as God's child, must be concerned. My father's business is my business. Right? If he grieves over it, I grieve over it. Right? You're not safe to escape oppression. So today's salvation is okay. Trust Christ, you go to heaven. Don't get all this. You go to hell. That's salvation. No, salvation is to be more like Christ. That's what it is. Salvation is to be. You are safe from destruction, but safe to Christ likeness. And what is Christ likeness? He cares for the weak. His whole ministry. It's not that God 
ignores the, the wealthy, you know. And Jesus' ministry was always to the weak, the oppressed. Why? Because the ones up there don't need your help. It's the ones down there who need your help. He was with the crowds. He was with the beggars, the lepers, the outcasts who were being oppressed. Is this your ministry? Is this your Christianity? Or is it going to Bible study week after week? Attending beautiful book series. Listen, listen, listen. Is that what Christianity is about? It does appear that way. It does appear Christianity is a very elite religion. Many people say, wow, you know, Christians are the, the, the rich people, the smart people, the can study people. No. Christians are people who have a heart of Christ, indwelt with Christ, and care for the weak. God hates oppression of the weak. Do something about it. Be a voice for the voiceless. Right? Don't take this as normal. Okay? The Bible says in Nahum, God is going to avenge. God will deal. God's very grieved by this. Are you? Are you grieved? Okay? So I hope today this will be a little lesson for us. Okay? It is not about some old, old history, dusty history. Today, right in front of your eyes and my eyes, are people who oppress others. Are you a voice for them? Do you care? Do you lift a finger to help them? All right? You know, one day God will avenge. But today, today, you do something. This is Christianity. May God bless you. And may Nahum, the book of Nahum, not be a history book, but it be a guidebook for you. The beautiful God loves the poor. God bless you.